Hello and welcome back to my podcast, Lives, Talks, and Tea. My name is Ashley and I will be your host. I don't know why I'm moving my hands around. Okay. So today we are talking about this book right here, Never Enough by Judith Grizel. And I apologize if I'm butchering her last name. Um, I posted the review on this a couple weeks back and I, I'm actually late on posting this video. Um, but we'll get to that in a minute. First, the tea, and this will, is the first not homemade tea, and it won't be the last. Um, it's from Dunkin' Donuts, as you can tell. Um, it is a black tea, sweetened, unsweetened. That makes sense now. I asked for it sweetened. I'm like, it doesn't taste sweet. Uh, it is melting. I got it earlier in the day when I was seeing my clients, and now it is almost seven o'clock, which brings me back to my next talk point. If you are viewing this instead of listening to it, the lighting is different because I'm using my overhead light instead of natural light. It is late. It is almost 7 p.m. I was supposed to film this in the morning. I was lazy. So here we are at the end of my workday filming and just trying to get some things together. Also, excuse my voice. I've been very hoarse lately. I think I've just been talking too much. Let me take a little sippy sip of my tea. I like sweet tea, so I'm a little sad that it's unsweetened. I've been drinking it unsweetened. I also should not be drinking black tea this late at night, but I digress. Today we are talking about this book. Today's episode is just going to be like a book review, but it's also going to be a bit of housekeeping just because of all the craziness that has been going on with the news. So I live in the United States and there's just a lot of news media everywhere reviewing all sorts of things um specifically the coronavirus so i recently went to the west coast to visit family and the amount of fear and the amount of concern over the coronavirus you can just tell sitting in an airport you can tell being in the environment that everyone was just genuinely concerned about what was going on and I I was concerned myself however I went into the situation more alert about what was going on than fearful because um, I am not in the age group that is to get severely sick or deadly sick I am early 20s so I would just get a very bad flu essentially knowing that however a lot of the information out there and the world's obsessed with numbers is that this is a rising pandemic it's a rising situation and I think for my viewers the three of you that are out there um, to just be smart and I talked about this in my first episode is just to be smart about what is going on the numbers are going up because there's more test kits going out, more people are being able to be tested for it. There's been many stories where people had just not gone to the hospital and thought they were sick with the normal flu and it turns out they actually did have the virus and were fine after a couple of weeks. Cause that's genuinely what happens when you get a cold, you get sick and then you kind of pop out the other side fairly well. Um, obviously this is a different situation because there are rising death numbers which is going to go with any illness. I think it's just best to be smart rather than to use this time as an excuse to do dumb things. Literally went shopping yesterday for food and like all the hand sanitizers were gone. Which, okay, smart, gotta make sure your hands are clean, but also just be smart. Obviously if you're touching things, don't touch your face, don't touch things around your face. If you are in the new area and there's a bathroom available, go wash your hands and like actually spend time scrubbing your hands clean and not just a little bit of soap once over and then wash it off. It's not going to clean your hands. But yeah, just be smart. Use your resources. Educate yourself. I'll post some stuff in the description of one of the other YouTubers that I follow that has really good information about the coronavirus. I'll post updated information about it from the CDC. Um, on in the description below. Always use anything with .gov, .net, .org. Don't listen to .coms. Don't listen to opinion pieces. A lot of the media out there is just written to scare you. I am not an expert. The information I'm giving you is information I've read from experts. 
listen to the experts. Don't listen to a freaking political figure talking about the coronavirus. Don't listen to a newscaster talking about the coronavirus. Listen to experts that are specialized in the medicine and trust them. Not the jokesters online or anything like that because it's just not helpful for the public. It's not helpful for you and it's just causing too much fear. Take your vitamins, wash your hands, be clean, be healthy. That's all I got for you on that. Moving on to fun stuff, drugs. So this book was recommended to me by one of my supervisor's colleagues who worked with substance abuse um, at the hospital I was interning at. She recommended this book for the simple fact that this book breaks down and as you can see right here, it says the neuroscience and experience of addiction. It breaks down the different classifications of drugs effects on the brain and the addictive qualities of those drugs on the brain. So as stated in my review, but I'll sh read it off right now. The classifications that she has in the books are um, THC, so marijuana, um, salvia, and I believe there's something else that has THC in it. Opioids, which kind of goes with like the pain medications and stuff like that. Alcohol, given. Tranquilizers, um, so any sort of downer pill or substance. Stimulants, which kind of goes with ADHD medication. Cocaine, I believe, falls in that. Um, I think, L no, I think LSD is something, yeah. Um, psychedelics, which is the next one, so LSD falls into that, shrooms falls into that, and other abused drugs. That last category is essentially a catch-all, and it, she goes over, I believe ketamine was one of them, some synthetic ones that were also in there, um, just kind of random ones. I think there was one, a drug that was popular in like India that isn't really like popular here, but it's widely abused over there. Just kind of other drugs that are commonly abused, but aren't really in like the top groupings of the categories. Um, I really enjoyed this book myself just because it kind of delves into the brain, the brain chemistry, what interlopes with what, and it kind of guides you through what that drug does to the brain. And another interesting thing, so I have a couple of notes on my laptop ahead of me, and it says that as of 2013, 24 million Americans aged 12 and older um, had used illicit drugs in the past month. And the number essentially has gone up exponentially since 10 years prior. And the most used drug is marijuana. Um, as of now, so this kind of goes with the coronavirus conversation, today is March 10th, um, so information changes. Today is March 10th, this um, is from drugabuse.gov and it was published in 2015, so that number is most likely have gone up since then, because for most numbers, numbers do go up a lot, um, let's see if they have a, oh it's actually you know, so numbers do change a lot. So it's actually 38% of adults as of 2017 battle with illicit drug use. 19 million adults, um, and this is actually classifying 12 and older, are currently battling with substance use disorder. Um, so these are the kind of current numbers. And then another number on here that's also really important to this is 8.5 million of adults suffer from both substance use disorder and mental health disorders. The reason this classifies with this, Ms. Judith Grissel herself talks about her story and talks about her struggles. And part of the story was her own battle with mental health and how substances are used to essentially help her medicate herself. And that is a common thing with people who have undiagnosed mental health disorders and a common reason a lot of substance uses get started. Substance use is almost always a co-occurring with something else, either it's trauma, mental health, it's usually never a standalone. Co-occurring means that it is commonly coupled with something else. So depression is usually always co-occurring with anxiety just because they have a lot of shared symptoms and it's very easy for them to just kind of intermingle and live with one another essentially. 
Same with drug abuse. Drug abuse is very co-occurring with anxiety disorders, post-traumatic stress disorders, um, a lot of the heavier mental health disorders as well, so schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, um, substance use plays a really big role. And so this book, as me as a therapist, kind of gave me insight on what exactly was the addiction, what exactly was the calling, and how exactly the brain played a role in either numbing these feelings or helping the individual kind of live through what they're currently going through. So Miss um, Judith Grizel, like many, started substance use really young, and it looks at like 12 and older, so 12. Um, is kind of when people start kind of exploring and getting into all these things. That's when she started. I don't believe it, I think it was 14. Um, and for most people, they say, oh, I'm just trying it. However, it does end up being a very slippery slope if someone does not have self-control. Substance use is a hard thing to tackle and it's a hard thing to address and it's a very touchy subject. And, and something that I really did enjoy about the book is that she kind of started the conversation with herself. She was very open and honest with her own struggles and open and honest with, I'm on the other side now. I love that. I love anyone that's able to use their story to try to motivate and inspire others to kind of do the same. She is also someone who was able to turn her life around and make it meaningful for others. A lot of people who struggle with substance uses don't feel like they're able to turn their life around or don't feel like there's a way out. Um, and there is, there's always a way out. It's just finding the way and finding the power to do it. And everything comes with time, which goes with this book and it also goes with a lot of other books. Um, same with the book last month with um, Game of Desire and a lot of books to come. Time is a big factor with decisions. Um, there was a story I was told a while back and it kind of stuck with me. Um, my professor had a client who was, an abusive, who was in an abusive marriage. She was physically abused all the time, emotionally abused, and she was with this individual for many, many, many years. And finally, after years of wanting to leave but didn't, she finally left. Um, she got on her own two feet, she left, she started being independent, she started getting an education, she started going to therapy, and she told my professor, who was her therapist, that she wished she would have done it sooner. And his comment to her was, I'm glad you didn't for the simple fact that if you would have done it sooner, you wouldn't have been able to stick with it. And his explanation is, if she would have done this, a year, two years, ten years before she was ready to do it, she would have gone back. She would have gone back to her abuser because that is a common cycle with abuse. Women, I think the average number of attempts to leave is around seven um, to leave an abusive relationship, men and women. Um, but I feel like that's something that speaks volumes to any sort of heavy decision, drug abuse, anything, that you're not ready until you're ready. And if you try to do it prior, you're going to go back to any of those bad habits. And this is not an excuse for those individuals saying, well, I'm not ready yet. I'm just going to keep living my life. This is not an excuse for you because you're making an excuse for yourself. This is for individuals who are finally able to pull themselves out and are guilting themselves for not doing it sooner. I'm watching you. So. She is um, a, has a PhD and I believe it's it's in the back hole. <laughs> she's a behavior neuroscientist and a professor of psychology. So she's actually studying and learning all this. And her main drive is understanding why people become addictive and understanding what is causing this addiction. And she speaks about it in the book. And per chapter, she talks about her own interactions in her own daily life with what was used, what was not used. So she kind of goes through with like THC and alcohol, like how she used it, what it did for her, the stories that came with it and kind of the outcome of the use. And you follow her through the end, and at the end I think it becomes very blatantly obvious to herself and the reader that all this use did not help her achieve anything that she wanted to achieve, but made her feel worse. Um, and she turned her life around and finally got hit rock bottom. And I love that expression because it just fits so well with substance use and kind of 
bad behaviors is that you're not going to change until you're pretty much at the bottom of your rope. What is going to push you enough to kind of keep moving forward and make the change that's on you? That's not on anyone else's responsibility but your own to kind of make that choice for yourself. And you putting it on someone else to make it their decision just shows how toxic you are to them and how toxic you are to yourself. I personally will recommend this book to anyone that wants to read it and we'll kind of dive more into some of the conversations, some of the workings, but the main thing with the book is the brain. I am obsessed with anything that is brain related. I do not specialize in brains, but I would love to just kind of get more about it. But essentially, when it comes to substances, the reward system of the brain releases the happy drugs, happy chemicals, what you want to call them, dopamine, oxytocin, um, and a couple other ones. I forget all the big names. And she talks a lot about the science of what causes what to stay in the brain longer, what creates more. So one good example I can give you is cocaine causes an excess amount of dopamine to stay in the brain longer, giving you that happy high. Um, THC causes a slower uptake of the dopamine, which is kind of gives you the all body high. Alcohol is a depressant, meaning it lowers your inhibitions and kind of relaxes the system. So it kind of gives you the laid back vibe. Um, and she kind of goes through it and it goes to the different parts of the brain, such as like logic and processing and all that jazz. I recommend the book. I find it a lovely book to read and I enjoyed it thoroughly as someone who hasn't really delved into that world because I'm able to understand the people I know is using that drug or using that drink as something deeper to them. And I can understand their point of view a bit better and be more empathetic towards that conversation. And actually have more information to hold on my own during those conversations. To just understand either my clients or my peers on a deeper level than someone who has never really experimented with substances in any shape, way, or form. If you have them, maybe it'll give you some insight to your own self and your own brain. And if you're trying to get out, oh, maybe it'll give you something to look towards. Today's talk was short, sweet, and simple, but I feel like the next talk we'll actually be able to talk more specifically about the beginnings of substance use, the getting help, and then the recovery portion. I will link down below um, resources for supportive care for NA, AA, and Al-Anon. Um, I will link down some references if you would like about recovery and things that may help. Um, yeah, thank you for joining me on this mini conversation. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.